Welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. My name is Ayuli Jemide. I'm the lead partner of Detail Commercial Solicitors, and I'll be moderating this webinar. This is an IE Nigeria uh, alumni webinar, and the subject matter is creating and preserving wealth in an uncertain world. Warren Buffett was quoted as saying, in the business world, the rear view mirror is always clearer than the windshield. And what we're trying to do today is to see if we can take away some of the haze and the dew from the windshield, because it's always uncertain going forward. But sometimes in that uncertainty, you can see some opportunities. You can see some opportunities to create wealth. You can see some opportunities to preserve wealth. So we just want to have a discussion around uh, that subject matter. And with me uh, to stoke this discussion are uh, three very intelligent people, Brenda, Olaolua, and Deji. Um, I'll give them an opportunity to introduce themselves, beginning with Brenda. Hi, everyone. My name is Brenda Piocha. I am a Cargill's Agricultural Supply Chain Business Lead for Global IT in the Africa region, as well as the Vice President for Upside Africa, an NGO that seeks to inspire change on the African continent and in the diaspora. Thank you, Brenda. My name is um, Olaolua, and I'm the CEO of eSettlement Limited, um, Lagos, Nigeria. Um, we run an agent banking platform with over 20,000 agents across the country. Uh, we provide access to financial services, mostly for people that live in rural areas and peri-urban areas. Services like cash withdrawal, cash deposits, fund transfers, bill payments, and so on and so forth. You know, so um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much, Ola Lua. Um, hi, guys. So my name is DJ. And I'm a senior product manager at Clickital. We build chatbots and chat applications for large enterprises in Africa, in North America, and in Latin America. And in my role, I'm largely focused on scaling chat commerce initiatives across those regions. So if anyone here is interested in leveraging the power of chat commerce for the organizations, you know, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much, Deji. Just to let you all know that we have um... Kachi A.K., who's the IE Nigeria Office Director, and Joseph Stern, who's in charge of careers and alumni for NEA IE University. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for connecting. Uh, we would like to welcome you to this, uh, to this uh, alumni-led initiative that we are really excited to, to support and endorse uh, to, to try and keep the community engaged for, um, for the Middle East and Africa. We're trying to, to create some relative content during those hard times and talk about uh, our distinguished alumni and their uh, personal experiences and how they managed to handle this, uh, this crisis and turn it into many, many positives. Uh, we have a great lineup today. I'm very, very excited and interested to hear about uh, everyone's story. And I know Ayuli has a nice uh, uh, content prepared for us. So that's it from my side. I hope you're going to enjoy this session. We're going to record it as well. And uh, later on, we can share it with everyone that that couldn't uh, connect today. And uh, we're going to post it on the around website. Thank you, Ayuli. So to start this conversation, I think we should start with a video. This video is simply about uh, a lady who owned a coffee shop in Dubai. Uh, and we'll see what the video says and, 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 and talk later. Raw coffee company is nearly 13 years old. We import green coffee beans that are a specialty grade. We roast them locally here in Dubai because of the coronavirus. We had to change very rapidly and switch everything now to B2C. As a senior management team, we're very happy to not take salary so that we could share that salary with our team. We've gone from 40 deliveries a day when we were a B2B business to 150 deliveries a day as a B2C business and now we can scale that. 
We're looking at understanding who our customers are and what we can do better for them. Moving more towards cashless transactions, making things simple to buy things online. We actually think we're going to change our business drastically because the landscape for us has changed. Now, um, having watched this video, uh, a few things uh, come out clearly, uh, you know, but I think the most important thing for me, and I'll leave the panelists to, to, to throw in their thoughts, the most important thing for me is adaptability. I, I think in this period, we just need to learn to be adaptable. Uh, businesses need to learn to change their business model as and when due. I'd like to start with Brenda. Uh, you know, Brenda, what do you think about this uh, video? And um, I, I think I should ask you, are we going to see some more uh, B2C or more B2B transactions going forward? I think it will be a mix of both. Uh, the question is, what is your market and what are you trying to provide? Um, when you look at the different startups, let's take agriculture, right? You've got a farmer, which could actually be a small player or a big commercial farmer at the end of the day. Now, that small player is not automatically going to get connected to the big sort of supermarket. So there'll be a lot of B2B. Is the people within the neighborhood? It could also be people within the surrounds of the city. Um, quite often, I think maybe sometimes the mistake that people make is looking for that one big organization that you can approach that will solve a lot of your issues. Um, in Africa, volumes count, as in with many uh, emerging and growing markets, volumes count. So look at the people who demand your services closer to you within your cities, your region, and your country. And there's a lot of B2C business that needs to be had. Um, you saw in the Dubai video there, they move from big B to B to B2C. People still need coffee. They can roast it, they can deliver it, your supply chain is together, you will deliver the value. The question is, are you organized in a way to deliver that and to respond very quickly to the market, whether it's a small customer or big customer? Um, in the backdrop of where we are with a, a lot of, uh, you know, with the whole global pandemic, with uh, the coronavirus, what we've seen a lot of is that where we had a lot of um, international or cross-border sourcing, a lot of that became localized. People started looking for alternatives for local sourcing of goods um, because we couldn't move. The other thing is that many people also um, started looking at ways to pivot their systems. Uh, generally in, uh, in Africa, I mean, you have a lot of B2C type of businesses that are happening when it comes to supply chain. It's not just the big uh, organizations and companies that you're going for. It is how do you connect the producer who's not a massive player uh, to a big player or someone else who is just demanding their product and service. So adaptability to get uh, access to local goods um, and substituting those for internationally imported goods, along with also looking at ways to add additional value to what you're already doing. I would also like to, to add a bit to that as well. I think that essentially the ability for a company or an institution to survive rest largely on his ability to adapt. Even from, from the startup point of view, a lot of times if you start a business, you are going to say, this is how my business is going to work. These are the people that are going to be my customers. And this is the value I'm going to add to them and they will pay me for it. But most of the time, I think maybe like nine out of 10 times, when you push that product into the market, the market eventually decides what, is going to, what they are going to pay for and what is of value to them. So companies that do well are those that are able to adapt to the environment and especially to the market in terms of getting that product market fit. So I think that, you know, for you to be able to survive pandemic or post-pandemic, it is that ability to be able to understand what the market is saying and be able to adapt your business. So, um, you know, one thing that came out clear from, from, from the video, uh, the Dubai coffee shop, uh, was that the lady... Uh, was clearly moving to more cashless transactions. Um, so now, Lord, what do you think? I mean, do you think we're going to see more cashless transactions going forward? Um, definitely. But uh, apart from that, I think that uh, generally, 
there will be a natural growth because transactions would increase. So take, for instance, um, what we've seen over time is that when there are issues, uh, because tra tra transactions really are fundamentally, um, they're they like the basics of life. There are things that people need to transact to be able to either buy or sell, either a product or a service. People always need to transact no matter what. So there is nothing that is going to take away the volume of payments, the volume of transactions. It will always be a constant or something that would even grow during a pandemic because then people need to you know, do more um, sending of money. People need to pay for things. People need to buy things in bulk. So transactions naturally would increase. And then due to a natural increase, first of all, there will be an increment in electronic transactions. But apart from that as well, there is also the fact of, uh, so like some, for instance, some banks have been pushing that, which everybody knows, you don't actually need to touch the cash. If you can do transactions electronically, it is safer and it will help you, you know, it, it, it's more hygienic in that context. You know, so naturally, there's just going to be a natural increment in the amount of transactions happening either electronically or even physical cash. Um, let's look at the graph from the e-payments uh, space in Nigeria over the last couple of months, just to help us with this discussion. Yes, we, we, we can see this. And um, this is actually very, very impressive. And I, I believe that this is, um, this is data for, for the Nigerian market. And uh, I think that this just proves to show that, you know, number one, transactions are increasing, which is good. But number, I, I think most importantly, that people are starting to adopt mobile, which is um, really just fantastic. So you can see that the year-to-year -year increment, and if you look at the 2020, the green strokes there is, 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 is really, really fantastic. So it just generally gives that feeling that for the industry, you know, the industry is coming of age and more and more transactions are going to continue to happen through mobile channels. You know, more, more people are adopting mobile, um, smartphone penetration is growing and all that stuff. So this is just fantastic. And it just proves to show that transactions would continue to grow for now, for the next few years as well. They are likely to talk about logistics. I think that apart from uh, uh, what we've talked about, happiness, I think logistics will be key going forward. Uh, there could be some specific demands that will, you know, that will, that will birth some great new startups. What do you think? Thank you, Ayuni. So, um, I think logistics has always been an essential service. And um, when I think to the video that you shared earlier, the reason why the coffee company was able to adapt was because they incorporated some form of logistics solutions into their business and they were able to serve their customers. So in a way, logistics is essential. And what we've seen in the past few months is that logistics has been termed an essential service. So that's why organizations like Amazon were really able to scale up during the pandemic. And the reason, and the reason why this is so is because when you have customers on one end and businesses on the other end, logistics serves as a bridge between the businesses and the customers. And during the pandemic, you know, we saw a world where those customers that would usually walk into physical stores were asked mm -hmm. to stay home, which created a gap. So what that means is logistics became more essential because that was the only bridge for the businesses to get, you know, access to those customers. So even when the pandemic, you know, should fade away, the truth is, logistics would always remain an essential service. And for organizations that want to play in this space, definitely it's capital intensive, but it's obviously an avenue for, for wealth creation. It's obviously an avenue to preserve wealth because it's always going to be fundamental in bringing businesses and customers together. Thanks a lot. Brenda, you, you, you talked about a company called SafeBot a few days ago. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think it would be good to share what has happened to them over this period and where you see opportunities around that. Okay. So when you look at logistics 
and everything. It's not just about getting the goods to people. It's also about storage. So now this is where Safe Border comes in. Safe Border is basically a motorcycle taxi hailing system uh, set up from Uganda, where I'm from. So whenever I go to Kampala, um, I use a motorcycle to get around town. It's quick, it's fast, and it's safe. So what they've now done with the lockdown was to do something that most of us have probably thought but never really executed. Typically in our cities, we go to the market, right? Uh, we can find someone who can do our shopping for us, but we negotiate. What Safe Border did was then to get shoppers for us. They put their app in the hands of the market vendors. So even if I needed my tomatoes, my onions, my green peppers, I would just put an order online and then what would happen, it would go into a queue and the vendor closest to me would pick up my order, pack it for me. That would then integrate with the closest border border driver, which is a motorcycle taxi rider, who would then go to the market, pick up my groceries and deliver that to me. So you found that they've managed to make sure that the vendors at the market still have an income, provide their service, and also the riders were able to continue operating. Because in Uganda, private cars were no longer allowed unless you had a permit to move around. The other thing that also they've managed to do on Pivot is they've collaborated with uh, another company called Trigger. And some of you may know them. Um, it's a company out of uh, Kenya and they basically source good quality produce from around the country and they then sell it online. So now guess what? Safe Border has found a partnership and they are the delivery mechanism for Trigger. So I order my goods and I, I saw one tweet, a lady ordered fruits and vegetables. 45 minutes later, they were delivered to her door by Safe Border. And that's where you see the power of collaboration. It's not about fighting for the space. It's about amplifying what we do in terms of services and connecting with each other. So, so in this period, uh, some people are home uh, locked down. Other people are home making money. And we can always see this by looking at the numbers and looking at the, the, the charts and the graphs. So let's see how the tech giants uh, have done and how they've been riding the wave in this period. Okay, so this is a very interesting graph and I think there are two things that I can pick out from from what I see here. So these are the large tech companies. And what we see is on, on the very positive side, we have Amazon that um, has grown about 26%. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have Apple that just managed to grow in Q1. And I think it's indicative of the fact that Apple, as much as it's a tech company, they are also relatively operations heavy. So a huge percentage of their sales come from iPhone sales, um, which are sold via physical stores. And um, they also have a very heavy reliance on their supply chain you know, across multiple countries outside of the US. So we can see how software organizations that you know, are not necessarily you know, um, hardware inclined, seem to have performed better during the height of, of the coronavirus. Um, another thing that, I, that this shows is also the fact that there's a lens that we could look at this from, um, and that's the lens of essential businesses and need-based businesses. So for Amazon, for instance, I mentioned earlier how logistics has been termed a very essential service. And we could see how they leverage on that service to grow during the coronavirus versus Apple that you know, would just traditionally sell phones. So I think even during the pandemic and going forward, once we start to look at tech companies through the lens of the services they offer, are those services essential? Are those services need-based? You know, then we could see how you could create sustainable companies. So for instance, I'm sure we all know about Airbnb. Now, a lot of people would consider Airbnb, you know, a relatively large tech organization, but 
on the opposite side, you know, in 2020, their revenues and their valuations were halved, right? Because as much as they are a big tech organization, their services weren't necessarily essential. And when we think through what is an essential service, you know, we ask ourselves, can your customers leverage your service from the comfort of their home? And during the pandemic, you know, that was really literal because people were literally in their homes. So could they leverage Airbnb from their homes? No, they would need to leave their homes. They would need to get on a plane and then stay in a stranger's apartments. So going forward, when we're thinking through sustainable businesses, um, businesses that you could tag maybe pandemic proof or black swan event proof, you know, we look to software organizations that are not necessarily hardware or operations reliant, um, are largely focused on the cloud and really solve a critical need for customers that can be used even within the comfort of their homes. So you know, thinking of services like uh, Zoom, for instance, you know, people didn't have to leave their homes to use that service. So I think looking through that lens, we would see that in Q2, this graph would materially change. Um, I suspect Apple would be minus, Amazon would you know, further grow, and we would see some additional tech organizations that were not as big, but that are growing to that scale, primarily because they're able to leverage on the comforts of their customers in their homes. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Deji. Uh, Olavia, do you want to add something to this? Um, yes. So, so I, I think Deji has actually kind of really um, broken it down. But, but the truth is that when, when some things like, um, things like the pandemic happen, there's really nothing you can actually do in terms of, um, in terms of trying to fully um, be, be pandemic compliant. The, what I'm trying to say is that for Amazon, it wasn't, more, it wasn't about the, 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 the brilliance of Jeff Bezos to say a pandemic is coming we are actually going to do this and do this and we are going to grow by, by 30% or 25%. It was just because for some reasons, like they just said, you can classify them as essential. They were already providing certain services that made them more or less pandemic proof, you know? And same thing for the people like um, Microsoft as well, because Microsoft is mostly software. So even during the pandemic, people are still going to use Microsoft Teams. People are still going to use Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel, and they are going to pay for them it more or less made them pandemic proof, unlike some other businesses. So at the time when the pandemic starts, it's more or less just like the, the hammer is going to fall and then you, the hammer then decides where does your business land. Is it going to be on the essential side where your, 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 your sales will not be interrupted in any way? Or is it going to be on the one side where you then maybe need to start thinking of a way to dig out of the pandemic and, and look for a way that you can pivot to the essential side? So I, I think that is just my only addition. I think what the pandemic aside has highlighted is that technology is there, but without access and stability in it, um, many people are still left out. So for instance, uh, at Cargill, uh, many countries around the world started going into lockdown around March or so. We've got operations in uh, China, Wuhan, we have a factory right there. So already when that hit, we had to scale up very fast to connect people to work from home. And it wasn't just as simple as just give them an internet connection. Some already were connected, but you had to give them devices as well. And then you needed to make sure that all of our infrastructure was able to bear the load of this additional weight of people having to use it. So technology is great, but without scalability and resilience, even the best sort of laid out plan or design will falter and fail. So we must always remember to make sure we have the basics in place so that not only we can operate, but our customers can also get to us at the end of the day. So let's talk about technology for a bit, because um, it, it occurs to me that we're going to be seeing a lot of inventions in this period. 
Uh, so we want to know what people will be thinking post-pandemic. I mean, what kind of things would people be inventing? In what industries and in what sectors? Uh, you know, let's talk about that for a bit. Yes, guys. In addition to Ayuli's question, I also had a question about uh, what's going to happen post this pandemic. Uh, and do you think your team's product productivity and yours increased or decreased uh, during this past work from home period? You talk about the infrastructure, the infrastructure, and this is very geo-specific. Uh, do, do you think moving forward after this crisis, is this going to be the new norm or no? Coming to the office will always still very relevant. So I guess I could start. Um, so I would start with Ayuli's question. I'm thinking through technology. Um, and I'll touch on a few points that Brenda spoke on. I think technology in itself is just a tool and it's really the application of that technology that creates value. And um, going forward, I think the applications of technology would be seen across multiple industries. So for example, um, one industry where, you know, I believe technology would rapidly create a lot of value is in the biotech space. And that's primarily because before the pandemic, you know, if we take a country like the US, 50% um, of their budget goes to military spending. Um, and that's to shore up their defenses. And what we've seen during the pandemic is the military wasn't the last line of defense as every country thought. You know, the, the, the pandemic was actually, you know, more of a threat than um, the military. So I see a shift in, in funding, I see a shift in technological advancement in the biotech space um, as a form of defense and also, you know, a way to innovate against black swan events like the pandemic. So that's one industry I, I believe there would be a lot of technological advancements and a lot of spending from governments around the world. Because we've seen that even the best governments, you know, were almost crippled because of this pandemic. Another industry that I think there would be a lot of technological advancement in, um, I would say is the investment space. So there has been, or there is a huge shift right now that we see in the retail investment space. Uh, before the pandemic, you know, we had institutional investors, we had um, fund managers, we had investment managers. But what we've seen during the pandemic and what we expect to see going forward is technology has reduced or has completely eliminated the barriers to entry for retail investors. So across different countries, in the US, you have apps like Robinhood. In Canada, you have apps like Wealth Simple. In Nigeria, you have apps like Rise or Trove or Bamboo. These apps allow retail investors to access the equities market, to access the, um, the mutual funds market, and you know, basically get into the market at zero cost. So what that has done is it has balanced the scale. You don't necessarily need to pay huge sums of money to an investment manager to manage your portfolio. You could do it yourself. And there are two interesting case studies that happened you know, in the past few weeks. Um, they call it retail investors versus Warren Buffett and retail investors versus Carl Icahn. So for the Warren Buffett case, you know, he sold all his airline stocks, but he sold them to retail investors. And in the past few weeks, those retail investors have made um, huge returns on those stocks that um, Warren dropped. The second case study, you know, is Carl Icahn, who dumped all his stocks in an organization called Hertz because they were filing for bankruptcy. He lost 1.8 billion in, in that um, dump. But when he dumped it, um, retail investors in Robinhood bought those shares, and now the shares are up maybe 200, 300%. So we see a world where there's more power that has been handed to retail investors. You could buy shares, you could buy equities at any price and hold for as long as possible. 
and there was a research report from Goldman Sachs um, that when the stock market in the US was crashing in March, the number of new accounts that were signing up on Robinhood at the same time was increasing, which just shows that retail investors are starting to understand the value of, of the market. And I think technology um, is definitely going to continue to advance in that space. And um, you know, the third um, area where I believe technology would advance, and I might be a bit biased, is um, the chat commerce space. And that's the space I currently play in today. And that's because we see a world where the largest chat channels today have surpassed the largest social media channels. So when you think through Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, and other chat channels, we have a lot of engagement on those channels. Now, the idea behind chat commerce is we want organizations you know, to not focus on customer acquisition and instead go to where their customers currently are today. So you could engage with your customers via WhatsApp, you could engage with your customers via Facebook Messenger, and you could, consume, you could, you could actually perform transactions on those channels. So I also see a lot of advancements in that space where more businesses would start to adopt chats as a channel for commercial transactions. Vicky, speaking of, of uh, big losers and big winners that uh, came from this crisis, and this question, question is for all the panelists. If, if you guys have a million dollars today for you, where would you invest in, in your market? I'll start. Yeah, sure. The, the fact of the matter is, the pandemic is an event. It's not a destiny for all of us. People still need to eat, they need to go to school, they need to be healthy, and payments brings everything together before it connects out. So in terms of putting my money, I would invest in things like agriculture, production and value add, as well as in the, the space of uh, ed tech and uh, payments, because in order to transact, you need a medium. All right, um, for me, I would, um, I would focus on platform businesses. And when I say platform, I mean um, two things. One, a platform that connects the, the part, part, party A and party B, either the buyer or the seller. Or um, the second side is something that creates empowerment and jobs. So let me give an example. Businesses like Uber, because you have, you know, it's a platform business. So there's the driver and then there's the rider. Same businesses, even like Airbnb, because there's the, the house owner and then there's the guest. You know, and the reason this is important is because especially in markets like ours, like Nigeria as an example, people are suffering, like people need empowerment, people need jobs. So what we've seen over time is that any kind of business where you have an opportunity to create employment for others, like platform businesses. So Uber will employ, create employment automatically for the drivers. The same business that I'm in, like agent network, because we're automatically creating businesses and livelihood for the agents. What that means is that those type of businesses have some form of advantage already to succeed because the push would not be just from the owner of the business side. It will also be from the people that are benefiting from that business. In the case of Uber or Safebot, as an example, the riders. So because those kind of businesses actually create jobs and empowerment, I think that those are the kind of businesses I would like to, to push. I think in very simplistic terms, if I were to invest in, in an organization or in an industry today, I would focus on um, technology enabled organizations. Um, you could call them SaaS companies, primarily because they are high margin, high growth and low effort organizations with a large focus on low effort, right? Because as Brenda rightly said, um, the pandemic is just one event we don't know what the next Black Swan event would be. But if we are focused on building businesses that are traditionally low effort, um, traditionally high margin and high growth, we can almost be certain that when the next Black Swan event comes, we would be better positioned you know, to weather that storm. So 
it's really not about um, um, you know trying to plan for the future. It's just optimizing for success. And I think um, software organizations today, SaaS companies, are very well positioned to weather different kinds of storms, primarily because they are structured in a way that is relatively low effort to their customers and their users. Tesla has set up Giga factor batteries so that you know they can have their batteries manufactured at the, the factories they can have uh, the customers uh, supply chain risk uh, they can all that they have a certain level of sustainability you know and you know I, I think they've been of the pack so uh, then the question at this point on the back of this how do you see the supply chain changing over the next couple of years um Looking at things, I think we'll probably see a lot more uh, smaller players. Don't just look at the DHLs um, of the world and the FedExes of the world. So now what that means for some of you that don't know is that we are moving towards creating a regional economic trading block and being able to solve cross-border problems, not just with big players, but also small ones will be important. The likes of companies like Yebonte Express, which is a Senegalese startup, um, they are basically a platform business that connect independent and casual delivery um, services and people um, to businesses at the end of the day. So it's almost like an Uber for delivery and courier services. So I hope to get to see more of that. So greater levels of job creation can occur. Also, uh, another thing I'd like to see is more around um, storage and optimization of storage, which is a big thing. We have this gap where people are looking for storage. Those who have storage aren't aware of those who need storage, and there's this vacancy that exists. So I'd like to see more companies like, for instance, Logistify AI, which is a Ugandan company that basically solves a problem like that. They bring together those with warehousing and storage capabilities, those looking for storage on a platform and you get real time information on where you can basically get, move um, and optimize storage at the end of the day. So two uh, areas that I'll speak about. I have a macro question to ask you in the end and pick your brain a little bit. Um, if you have to make two big bold predictions about how what will be the, the changes that will happen will result from this, whether it's lifestyle, uh, environment, uh, climate, uh, personnel, uh, the job world. If you, if you have to give two bold predictions about life post-COVID, what are the two main titles that come first to your brain, if you dare to say? All right. Um, so for me, the, the first I would say is um, remote work has come to stay. Um, even for my own organization, you know, all of a sudden we realized that, wait, we're still productive. You know, nobody has been to work in a while and we're still productive. So now that, you know, there's a bit of um, easing of the lockdown and um, we haven't really enforced for people to go back to work because people are still able to work from home. So I think that number one, remote work has come to stay, you know, remote work, remote meetings. You know, I, 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 I spoke to someone I haven't spoken to in a very long time. Um, a few days ago, and she was like, let's catch up. And I said, sure, we'll do a Zoom meeting. Because, you know, all of a sudden, if it was in the past, if it was the same conversation last year, it would have been, oh, let's have coffee. Or let's, no, but all of a sudden, we realized that you can't actually catch up with someone and it's just going to be on Zoom or or, micro, or even WhatsApp call or something. We, so remote work is, is now part of our life, at least for the, for the next few years. That is one. And then secondly, not as serious, I think, um, at least maybe for the next one year, there will be um, a fashion thing in terms of um, the face mask. And also in Nigeria, as an example, a lot of people now, you know, you wear the face masks like every time. So I, I think that um, fashion sense-wise, people are going to have clothes that match with their face masks. You wear a white shirt, you wear a white face mask, you wear a black shirt, black face masks. So I think that maybe that will stay for like about a year or so, uh, as well. So that's, that's it for me. I'll go next. Um... To answer that question, rather than a bold prediction, how about bold execution? We've got a lot of things that are still not in place. So let us not waste the pandemic. Make sure we have the digital and hard infrastructure. Make sure digital literacy goes up. 
make sure we have the tech available so that everything that we are talking about has a good springboard to just thrive. People still need to eat, they need to be healthy, they need to be educated, but let us be disciplined to execute consistently. So we're not talking in 10 years about the fact that we don't have connectivity. And let us make rural communities thrive at the end of the day. Not everyone should run to the cities. Every part of each country should thrive. So be bold and get the basics in. Niji, anything to say? Well, so let me take a contrarian view. Uh, I think at the height of the pandemic, you know, a lot of people thought you know, this was going to go on for a very long time and that it would last long enough to change the way we do things. But there's a world where, you know, that might not happen and people are still optimistic to get back to the way things were. Uh, we've seen that in, in, in a couple of countries, in Nigeria, for instance, the lockdown was only done for five weeks. And, you know, after that, they quickly reopened. Um, for companies that um, were looking to IPO, for example, like Airbnb, um, now they have bookings that have surged past their levels last year. You know, so there's a world where, you know, this hasn't lasted long enough to change our lifestyles. And from the lifestyle perspective, you know, things might just go back to the way they were. From, however, from, the, from an organization's perspective, um, I think there would be a rapid adoption for technology, primarily because there are a lot of technologies today, um, especially on the African continent, that are huge for organizations when it comes to cost reduction. So when you think through having to, to, to renew your office lease to hold 100 to 1,000 people um, versus having distributed teams you know, across different locations, then you, you start to see you know, the value of technology. So I think from a lifestyle perspective, things might not necessarily change. Um, people are eager to get back to the way things were. But from you know, a business perspective, I see there's going to be a rapid shift or a rapid adoption of technology to reduce um, overhead costs. Yeah, if, if, if I may add, um, I think there's a lot of technology related to health, safety, and environment. I hear that the Japanese have already invented a badge that you wear, and when you come close to someone whose temperature is high, it dips. I think you will see a lot of things like that going forward. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> so there's a fine line between that technology and privacy. Um, I think there's going to be um, a very strong push from a lot of quarters for that kind of technology that's quite invasive, you know. Um, but it's a compromise. The, yeah, you know, it's, it's the compromise. Would you let go of your privacy and your security for that semblance of protection? So I think there will be a lot of conversations in the future regarding how best to protect the, the human race from a pandemic like, um, like coronavirus. And those security concerns and security risks will start to come up from a health perspective. So I think this is an appropriate place to stop. We've been uh, a very interesting conversation. It's one hour. I think it's been very, very uh, intellectual, uh, more practical. Uh, wind chilled is less hazy. I think this conversation has helped us to see the future and uh, you know to make some wine we go along. I see that a few things strong in our conversations. One of them was stability. The other one was the fact that um, needs will be more important going forward in your business planning and in your wealth planning. But most importantly, I think that technology area is something that is uh, very important. Uh, I really enjoyed this talk with you guys. I really uh, first enjoyed this initiative that was led uh, first and foremost by the alumni and we're all, always happy to support. Thank you Ola, Brenda, Deji and Ayuli for dedicating the time and Pumi and Lara behind the scenes as well and everyone who had 
with this event. I really enjoyed this and thank you very much again for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much.